YouTube videos are full of anecdotes in which people share stories of how a change in their diet led to an amazing health transformation. And even though I guess most people have heard that anecdotes are not high level evidence, they seem to have a lot of influence on people's health behaviors. And quite honestly, I understand. I do nutrition science as my full-time job, and even I have spent more hours than I dare to admit watching videos right here on YouTube of people sharing how they lost a lot of weight, how they reversed their type 2 diabetes, or how they got rid of their debilitating autoimmune disease. So I get it, these types of anecdotes are inspiring. And it's kind of fun to see people feeling empowered to take charge of their own health and getting great results. But how much can we actually learn from anecdotes? And specifically, do anecdotes count as evidence about what we should eat? That's what we're going to cover in this video. I will give you five specific reasons why it is important to be skeptical and cautious when it comes to anecdotes, no matter how amazing and plausible they may sound. And we'll close with a discussion of how we can think about these anecdotes in the bigger context of scientific evidence. So let's dive right in. Reason one is probably the most obvious one. There is no way of knowing, you know, if someone shares an anecdote, that the suggested health benefits may apply to everyone or even most people. In science lingo, we would say that an anecdote doesn't provide us with any data on how generalizable it is to other people. Imagine you watch a video of someone who shares that they used to have chronic migraines that went away entirely when they switched to a vegan diet. They used to have migraines two or three times a week for years, but since they've gone vegan, they have barely had one. Let's say you had a history of migraines. I bet you would be fascinated by this kind of story and maybe even inclined to also give a vegan diet a try. That's totally understandable. Migraines are terrible, and particularly for conditions for which we have no real cure, it's very natural to want to find something that helps. But what I'd like to suggest is that you ask yourself when you hear a story like this is whether this would help all or at least most people with migraines. Imagine you were a researcher and you wanted to find out if a vegan diet helps with migraines. What would you do? You would recruit a large group of people with migraines, let's say 200, and randomize them to say switch to a vegan diet and keep eating their normal diet. Now, that would give you a clear picture of how many people with migraines actually benefit from the vegan diet. If only one or two of your 100 participants on the vegan diet got rid of their migraines, well, they could still start a YouTube channel and tell the world about it, but you would know better that most people's migraines don't get better by going on a vegan diet. You would also be able to compare the improvements on the vegan diet with those on the control diet. But let's ignore that for now, as we'll get to that in a minute. So the first big problem with anecdotes is that an anecdote doesn't provide any data on how generalizable the phenomenon is to other people with migraines. It's fine to be open to the possibility that the anecdote may hold some truth for others, or maybe even all people with that condition. But it's important to be clear that it's as well possible that it isn't generalizable. Reason two is related to this. Let's call this a positive selection bias. In our previous example of a randomized controlled trial, let's assume that one person reported not having any more migraines on the vegan diet, while the other 99 that were randomized to that diet reported no or very little benefit. Well, who is most likely to start a YouTube channel and share passionate stories about the benefits of a vegan diet? Quite obviously, these folks here would have little to talk about, right? You may have noticed that there is a relative lack of videos on YouTube with titles such as still massive migraines on my vegan diet. People click on videos that promise help or something amazing or unusual. And as a result, those are the videos that get made. Reason three is the good old placebo effect. Every time someone makes a conscious decision to change their diet or lifestyle, they do that because they think or hope that they will benefit from it in some way. And research tells us that just thinking or hoping this may actually help all by itself. The point I'm making here is that yes, someone may absolutely have gotten fewer migraines on a vegan diet, but that effect may have little to do with the specific type of diet the person ate and more with the expectation to get better. This here is a meta-analysis, basically a study of studies on the placebo effect in clinical trials testing migraine medications. They report that among patients with migraines who are randomized to a placebo pill, 27% reported an improvement. Let this sink in. The researchers were testing some real drug that they thought would improve migraines. And as a comparison group, they gave controls a pill with no active ingredient in it. And in 27% of these patients who got the sugar pill, it helped, even though it shouldn't have. And listen to this. If the placebo was not given as a pill, but injected with a needle, 
then it helped even more people. The commonly accepted explanation for these observations is that people get better simply because they think they may get better. And apparently people think of an injection as a more effective thing than a pill. So placebo injections work even better than placebo pills. Even though both should be equally ineffective. The same is true for weight loss, by the way. In randomized controlled trials, it is common for people in a control group who receive a placebo pill to lose some weight. But commonly they lose a lot more if the placebo is injected. Now sometimes I hear people talk about placebo as if it's a bad thing. I personally find these observations around placebos totally fascinating. What this shows is that our own mind can make us get better and actually result in measurable benefits for our health. Nevertheless, if we want to understand how a drug, a food, or a diet affects a health condition, the placebo effect is one of the reasons why we want to compare changes in a treatment group to those in a control group. If a single person experiments with a dietary change, it is next to impossible to be certain that any change is indeed related to that dietary change and not to a large degree or entirely because of the placebo effect. This is directly related to reason number four, which is that a specific dietary factor is really difficult to isolate in people eating complex diets. So if someone changes their diet, they usually change many things in terms of what they eat, but also in terms of what they no longer eat or less of. In our imaginary example, let's assume that someone may try the vegan diet because maybe they read somewhere that animal products can cause migraines. And let's say they actually get rid of their migraines. It would still be wrong to conclude that the improvement was caused by cutting out animal foods and that cutting out animal foods will help all people with migraines. Maybe it was only some animal foods and maybe only because that particular person had an allergy to that food. Or maybe the improvement had nothing to do with eating less animal products and more with eating more fruit and vegetables. Okay, reason number five is our final one and I think it's a particularly important one. We need to consider that any benefits a person shares may be temporary, or adverse effects or risks may not immediately be apparent. To illustrate this point, let's use another example to limit the hate mail I'm going to get from the vegan camp. Let's assume you watch one of the very popular carnivore channels on YouTube, and someone shares that they used to have a nasty autoimmune disease that has entirely disappeared since they've gone on the carnivore diet. Two things we need to keep in mind. Many autoimmune diseases show a pattern of remission and relapse, even if you don't do anything special. To be really certain that an autoimmune disease is truly in remission, or as some people claim even cured, you would need to be relapse free for a very extended period of time. Just because someone currently doesn't have any symptoms doesn't mean their disease is cured, and even if it was currently in remission, it may have nothing or little to do with the person's diet. The other aspect is that of health risks or adverse effects. The carnivore diet is a good example in this regard as well. Now on this diet, most people eat just meat, fish and shellfish, while some people also add eggs and certain types of dairy such as cheese. That means that total fat and saturated fat intakes are very high and the intake of certain micronutrients such as say calcium may be very low depending on whether cheese is eaten. Without going into too much detail here, Suffice it to say that most experts would probably be concerned about an increased long-term risk of cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis on a carnivore diet. Even if a carnivore claims that they have been doing very well on this diet for many years, that is not to say they may not have substantial health problems down the road. Cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis in particular take a while to manifest. Or even if they you know, don't develop these diseases, you may if you follow the advice. There is something else I'd like to get off my chest that is related to this point. The one thing I am the most annoyed with is when people share an anecdote of how they got rid of their migraines, how they lost weight, or how they suddenly have more energy or whatever it is. They don't just report this, which I absolutely agree would be an interesting observation. Instead, they often start to sell this food or this diet as the best human diet, the cure for everything, and deny that anything could ever be wrong with it. Now let's be real, for an extreme diet such as a vegan diet or a carnivore diet in particular, it is very well possible that you can feel better and some health conditions can get better, while at the same time, the same way of eating could increase your long-term risk of other diseases. Try to be open to that in the interest of your health. Let me emphasize that it's not my intent to hate on any one particular diet. As may have become clear to you if you watched any of my previous videos, I hold the position that humans are pretty flexible and that they can be healthy on a wide range of very different diets. 
I'm hating though on exaggerated superficial and non-scientific claims made in support of eating a certain way. Because real harm can come from that to unsuspecting viewers who are desperate to improve their health. My goal with this video was to help you develop a healthy dose of skepticism whenever you come across nutrition anecdotes, particularly if someone uses the anecdote to sell you something. I absolutely understand the appeal. Anecdotes tend to offer fairly simple, convincing solutions to sometimes desperate chronic health problems. But just because it sounds good doesn't mean it is sound advice. Basing your health on anecdotes from YouTubers that provide no other sources of evidence, or even ignore scientific evidence, is similar to buying a car because the used car salesman told you it's a great deal. You would be a little bit skeptical there, right? So why not apply the same kind of skepticism when you are making decisions about your health? Still, as skeptical as I am, let me reiterate that I enjoy hearing about case studies of people who turned their health around by making a change to their diet and lifestyle. I even think that these types of anecdotes do provide some very low level scientific value. But that needs to be clearly emphasized. Anecdotes are very low level evidence, at best, and some of my colleagues would probably even disagree with that. If we look at the hierarchy of evidence, it is obvious that a well-conducted randomized controlled trial provides much stronger evidence. Randomized controlled trials provide us with information about the generalizability of our observation. Also, we are not just looking at people in whom the intervention worked, but everyone who was exposed to it. In a randomized controlled trial, we also have a control group, which helps us take any placebo effect into account. And ideally, we are also able to isolate the exact dietary factor we're interested in, and conduct the study for a time period that allows us to collect data also on long-term risks and adverse events. The different types of observational studies, as much as people constantly criticize them, also provide substantially more robust evidence than anecdotes. So ideally, we should form an opinion about the health effects of a food or a diet by looking at systematic reviews or meta-analyses, so studies of studies, that consider the totality of the evidence from several randomized controlled trials and several observational studies. Now, admittedly, for many questions we have about nutrition and health, this is not an option. We simply have very little robust data, for example, on whether there is a dietary approach to improve certain conditions, such as neurodegenerative diseases or many autoimmune diseases. And that's where I think we should at least consider lower level evidence. Down here, at the lowest level of evidence, that's where I would categorize anecdotes. But even that only if they have been clinically documented as a case study, or even better, a case series of several related cases. Here is also where I would categorize something like expert opinions. Then we have animal studies that I would actually rank similarly as very low level evidence. To clarify, animal studies can be amazing to figure out the basics of how biology works, but in my opinion, are not very useful to figure out what we as humans should eat. So I suppose most researchers would agree that these types of evidence here at the bottom are not strong pieces of evidence in and of themselves. At best, they can be useful to help inform hypotheses that can then be tested using these more rigorous methods up here. So don't totally discount anecdotal evidence. Be curious, let yourself be inspired, and let us use anecdotes to form hypotheses. But also, let's remain appropriately skeptical and let's require much higher quality evidence before we conduct an experiment on our own bodies. Alrighty, that's it for today. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this discussion, I would appreciate it if you would give the video a thumbs up and consider subscribing if you are interested in a nuanced discussion of the scientific evidence around nutrition, health and chronic disease. Take care.